So, passages. People ask me <clears throat> why I spend so much of my artistic uh, uh, output on looking at the past. And one person I have to thank for my fascination with the past and for the ancestors is my grandmother, Mary Jane Glover, who is pictured here on her first trip to New York City. Now, we called her Nanny. She lived to be 97. And I grew up looking through her photo albums and hearing hundreds and hundreds of stories about the people that she, uh, who raised her and their people. Her grandmother was a slave. My mother knew her great-grandmother who told m my mother uh, stories about being a slave. And uh, every summer, from the time I was so, I think, eight until I was in my mid to upper teens, I went to South Carolina. So my connect, though, although I'm from the Bronx and I grew up with, you know, this New York urban thing, I really relate to my southern roots and this, to the south. So, I, I grew up looking through photo albums with my grandmother, and she told me all about my great-grandparents and about the houses they lived in and who was in love with who and who had an affair with who and uh, all of this juicy stuff. The older I got, the juicier the stories got. <laughs> the image here in the center, in the square frame, is my great aunt Sally, my grandmother's aunt. Ironically, she looks just like my sister. And I talked my grandmother into giving me that portrait. And I began to collect these bubble glass, like convex glass portraits uh, from back in the day. They, <clears throat> they, were, they were all hand touched, hand colored, because you couldn't get a crisp, sharp image uh, of that size back in those, in the early days of photography. I have a collection of like 200 of these now. And these are cabinet cards. Some of the things that I used to gain inspiration I have a collection of about over 2,000 photographs, which I flip through. These are tintypes. I flip through when I'm looking for inspiration. Here, the tip, tim, tintypes have been taken out of the, the, uh, the cases and they were scanned. So if I want to work from one of these images, I can, uh, how do you say, uh, enhance it to bring out more detail. But pretty much, I, I mean, I, do, I work from images of people that I do not know. And I like the fact that uh, I'm not tied to narratives that, uh, I, I, I know about that specific person. And I spent a good 10 years doing works from my father's collection of photographs. He was a self-taught photographer. I helped him out in his dark room. And I did a lot of sort of autobiographical things that were based on his photos. When you see the exhibition, the small room which has the large drawings and the, the, the series is called Prologue, that 
that is, those are among the many, many pieces that I did uh, that were inspired by my father and personal uh, iconography and family. Back in <clears throat> the 90s, I went to Villa Valeme, which is uh, a villa outside of Rome. And I learned the history of the villa, that there were uh, slaves. The, 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 the person who built the villa was a slave trader, and so he had many slaves living there. And I made these drawings directly on the walls in order to sort of give some kind of recognition to the fact that those people had lived there. And then I went to Project Row Houses. I was invited to Houston for a year. I was 35 and I got my driver's license and moved to Houston. And I was asked immediately to uh, to do a row house. You know, um, it's a, a, a wonderful program where artists are um, commissioned to do site-specific works inside of the houses. And so I decided this was another opportunity to draw on the walls, which I really enjoyed and I loved working on the wood. And doing installations like this in old houses led me to working with antique objects. So here in this discrete room, off to the side, which you cannot enter, there, uh, there are antiques that I went out and bought, the clothing, the bed, the, you know, everything. And uh, so my flea marketing training from when I was a kid became part of my, um, my art practice. I used to go flea marketing, flea marketing in the outdoor flea markets in New Jersey with my grandmother. Now this is one of the very few tableau pieces that I've done of someone I know. And this is my grandmother, Mary Jane Glover. And um, <clears throat> you see, I began to use objects and uh, I enjoyed working on wood. And so I, I got wood from old houses. It was important to me that the wood was old and aged. And my grandmother lived to see this in a museum show. She was way up in her 90s, but she went around telling everybody, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so my instincts to use objects with the drawn images was a result of doing the installations in the old houses. And also I began to see connections between the, the stuff, the objects that were scattered around the studio or the house, and sometimes I would have a like a drawing here, and I'd see a connection between that and the, the, um, the object. And one day I picked up one of the objects and I placed it in front of a piece and it just popped. It just went snap. And so that led me on this track of working with found objects, combining them and juxtaposing them with drawn images.
This one is called Eight Rock. This is Wreath. I believe it's upstairs. I bought that in that 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 wire in in Austin and ripped my jeans with it. <laughs> Someone who saw Project Row Houses, uh, a Cuban woman, invited me to come to the Havana Biennale to do an installation. And so I had a real adventure going to Cuba. You know, in Cuba, they don't have antique stores because the, 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 the furniture that they live with are the things that they had before the revolution. They use them. Or else, you know, if they, 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 or else they buy like modern things. But I went to a few houses in Old Havana and I was able to borrow some of these objects and uh, create this installation. I drew, this is, this is in a, a 17th century Spanish fort and I was able to draw with the, the the charcoal directly on the walls. Interestingly enough, sometimes the walls were crumbly and the drawing would crumble and I just go back in and draw into the next level. That funeral program on the the stack of flowers was the only thing I brought with me. I really like going to uh, a venue without any preconceived notion of exactly what I'll do. But I, I found that in an antique store before I left for Havana and everything else was found there. So, since I loved working on wood and with found objects, I wanted to create pieces where, <clears throat> you know, since I, I couldn't be making rooms and, you know, full-scale installations in my studio. So I uh, started doing uh, what we call tableau pieces. They are um, on vintage lumber from old houses, old barns. In this case, it was from an old barn. And I make the drawings on the wood, and then I attach the found objects. Those are, that's a, that's a sconce with a, an oil lamp, as you can see. And I also wanted to bring the, um, the, the two-dimensional image of the, the person into our environment by using these objects that would, you know, bring them into our space. Oh, here I am drawing. I use these Conti crayons. <clears throat> I draw them by hand. My uh, Conte is just like charcoal, but it's just a richer black, so it shows up against the, the wood. And I like working with charcoal on wood because that's what charcoal is. It's burnt wood. So it's like returning to the source. This one is called Wise Like That. And this is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Sometimes my titles are a bit cryptic and sometimes they are um, like lines from old tunes, you know, like blues tunes or gospel tunes or poems. This one is called Bliss. 
And yes, that is whiskey. <laughs> this is called hope. Each of those jars contains some personal items that I was given by my grandmother that belonged to her ancestors. This is dusk potion. Tell them I'm flying. Okay, in 1999, I was given an opportunity to um, go to the University of North Texas in Denton. Now, I was given carte blanche to do anything I wanted, which is a wonderful opportunity for an artist to have an institution fund them and invite them, give them a residency so that they can create something new. You get an opportunity to work with materials you wouldn't ordinarily be able to work with. And so <clears throat> this, this piece was about a community in Denton, Texas called Quaker Town. And I, all of the, um, the some students at, at uh, UNT Denton helped build the house to my uh, my design, and I did all of the drawings from photographs from an archive about a half an hour away from Denton. So here, the viewer is invited to enter, and uh, the piece is called Whispers from the Walls. I don't know if I said that. We actually ripped these old shingles off of old houses. But they were old houses that were already condemned by the banks. So we got permission. Here's a piece that's part of that installation. Uh, there's an old blues tune that emanates from the, radio, from the record player, and the entire floor is covered with, with old clothes. Because here, I wanted to remove the viewer from the gallery space. I wanted to, the viewer to forget they were in a gallery. I covered the travertine floor with mulch, and then tons and tons of old clothes that was inspired by a, a, a visit I made to the, the uh, Holocaust Museum where they have these pi piles of shoes that were taken from the, the war prisoners. This one is called um, Walk in Blues. I don't always remember the names. But it was very important that those stereotypical uh, figures were pointing toward the wall and that the real black woman was looking at us and that she had dignity. She was not a caricature. This is called Strive. And those are boxing gloves. This is called having. It, <clears throat> uh, it got its name because all of those boxes are filled with coins. And the box near this woman's knee is some sort of champagne. But it's upside down, but the words say, always insist on having. So, 
Who do you think bought this piece? Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> okay, and this is upstairs. It is um, called America. This piece is called The Company, uh, no, sorry, it's called Rumor. And this is Shine, that's a, a shoe shine boot rest on the box in front and real shoes attached at the bottom of the canvas. Now, here's my first image of the Richmond Project. This is the original installation, which was created in uh, the hand workshop. Ashley Kistler, who was the curator at the hand workshop, gave me another <clears throat> tremendous opportunity to, to, uh, to come to Richmond and she gave me carte blanche again, which is like a gift. And it's a joy and a pleasure. I was, um, the one thing that Ashley told me about was, was Jackson Ward. And I was, uh, I had a lot of research to do about Jackson Ward and also some of the students that I worked with, I worked with 10 students, 10 or 12 students from VCU. And I loved each and every one of them. You hear what I said? <laughs> <laughs> I just adored them. They were so wonderful and they worked so hard on this installation. Uh, um, in six weeks, we managed to find the lumber find all of these antiques. I was able to do a lot of research. I spoke to historians all over Richmond. And, you know, one of the students asked me, how are you going to deal with being in the seat of the Confederacy? And my initial, that, that was at our first meeting, my initial response was, I didn't come here to deal with the Civil War. I came here to do, deal with Jackson Ward. But, they put me up in a house on Monument Avenue, and uh, Sarah Ferguson and Arjan Zazueta took me for my first day of driving around. We went to Fredericksburg and Lynchburg and places like that. And I realized just, oh, oh, and we, we came by the museum and we saw the daughters of the Confederacy. All right, so I realized I had to somehow touch upon that issue. I couldn't just focus on this one Jackson Ward community. And so this is the parlor. This is what, to me, this is what I call visitation. And I hope that you get to spend time in there and just reflect. Oh, okay, there's some other images that I was gonna talk about, but I did touch upon the Civil War with the Union soldier and that piece called Restoreth with the medicines. It's about healing from the tragedies of the past. Okay, so back to New York. More of these tableau pieces. Oh, I don't remember the names of all of them, but you know, uh, I certainly enjoy doing them. Uh, this is called Tea. Tea. It's a silver tea set. And this is called. Um, Take this hammer, which is part of an old folk tune. Take this hammer and hand it to the captain. It's about a slave that is about to run away. 
So I was looking for, you know, I was looking to make depictions of, of African Americans that, the, the kind of African Americans that, uh, that, 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 that people didn't see that often, especially people who, um, who haven't looked extensively at vintage photographs of, uh, of black people. So the next year, um, Carla Hensel, a friend of Ashley's, invited me to the, Vir the, Vir the, um, the Virginia Contemporary Arts Center in Virginia Beach, where I did this installation called Uh, it's called um, Sanctuary, the Great Dismal Swamp. And it's about, it's based on the fact that many runaway slaves, they were called maroons, they hid in the Dismal Swamp. The Dismal Swamp was called the Dismal Swamp because George Washington said that the conditions there were just so dismal, you know. Uh, and I got a chance to go to the lake in the center uh, and take a boat ride across the lake and walk around and I tried to create the feeling of walking around in this dense, Densely popular, uh, densely populated, densely uh, dense foliage and and trees and such. We got some we we got some trees that were slated to be uh, torn down, and we got them to bring them to the museum, and somehow they figured out how to stand them up. We got those uh, cypress knees. And this piece, this is the pool, which represents the lake in the center of the Dismal Swamp. I cannot remember the name off the top of my head, but it's a, it's a, a, a sizable lake which I said I took a boat ride across, and it's no deeper than six feet anywhere. And, and, and it's probably like a mile wide. You, 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 you go into the middle of the, the lake, and you can take a stick, and you can reach the bottom. And also, the water is very brown from the tannin that dripped from the, the um, juniper trees. But blacks who, were, who hid away in the, um, the swamp, they hid there for generations. And they got provisions from the outside in exchange for making shingles. So that's why I use that that sort of like remnant of shingled roofs, rooftops, and him being like the, representing the, the wood, wood carver. Okay, back to New York, more tableau. This is called Missouri. Train. And this one is Guide My Heart. Epic. The books on the, sh the shelf there are great epics in American history. And that's a World War II soldier. Sorry, World War I soldier? I don't know, I think it was World War. 
one. Thank you. <laughs> I've made a lot of artwork. It's hard to keep. <laughs> so I, be, I, I fell in love with these factory molds, which I had found the first of them digging and traveling around with Ashley in the... Um, in the uh, <clears throat> salvage yards. And so I found many of them and I've done several works with these foundry molds. Now the card pieces are, um, you know, you. Every artist has to have something peripheral that they do. You know, like you, you have your, your, your main massive thing that you do, but it's nice to just take a break and do something else. And so I make little drawings and I, and I, I find attachments. Here, I <clears throat> this is one of the pieces in this show. But I began my first card series back in 2002. I just did a drawing and picked up a card and just decided to place it there. And again, it popped. It clicked. And that led to me making the entire series of 54 cards. I mean, 52 cards plus two jokers, and sometimes one joker. Now this is an example of, of uh, <clears throat> what uh, lively, important uh, activity card playing was in my community. Now I am not a historian, but I've read that while the slaves were not allowed to learn how to read, they were taught to count because a lot of them had to take the goods to town and sell them and so they needed to know how to count currency and do basic arithmetic. And so <clears throat> card playing was part of uh, slave activities and it's remained a very strong part of of uh, social activity. This is my godmother in the center. She had like once or twice, one, every other month, she'd have a card party, which meant we all came and there were several tables set up and we'd play cards all day. That's my aunt's ring. I always love that photo shield. It looks like a lizard. <laughs> <laughs> now, in terms of the way I pair the cards up with the images, there's no easy way to, to explain it, except I would encourage you to read um, <clears throat> Uh, Bridget Cook's essay about the card series. Um, <clears throat> when I was a kid and too young to know, to understand the card games, I mused upon just looking at decks of cards, the drawings on the cards, the images on the cards, the way that you take the face cards and you turn it over and it was the same image but sometimes it was a little different and different decks had different shapes and what did the shapes mean? Diamonds, obviously diamonds, hearts obviously, you know and clubs, you know that, that kind of thing. So I spent being, you know, being a visual kid and um, being kind of different uh, I sat there just going through the card decks, checking out the artwork on the cards. And so, <clears throat> for me, the symbols on each card 
suggests narratives about the people who are drawn on the page. Sometimes they have literal ways, like if you put an image of a, a queen with an image of a very destitute looking older woman, you might think, oh, well, that sort of speaks about her life and, you know, she may think of herself as a queen or she may dream of being treated like a queen, et cetera, et cetera. If you really allow yourself to muse and to think about it, you'll see that each one has its own potential for a narrative. And they're not arbitrary. I spend a lot of time figuring out which card is, you know, it's like when it clicks, it clicks. And if it doesn't, I won't put it there. Ah, this piece is called 13. One of these old days. This is upstairs, it's uh, dawn to dawn. You know, the, um, <clears throat> the, the ellipse of dirt at the left side for me represents graves and you have this woman there with a shovel so perhaps that suggests that she has buried her loved one who went off to fight in a war. There are a lot of ways that, you know, people lose someone and uh, may have to bury them. And <clears throat> these two gentlemen here, proudly dressed in their World War I uniforms, uh, I mean, the irony of, of, of that image is that <clears throat> the World War I soldiers over in Europe who were African American were mostly used to dig graves and to bury the casualties. And this is Ode. North, my precarious life, ardor, at home and abroad, oh, those are all bullets. This one is called um, Beauty Without Regret. And this is Black Maybe. Silence. That is a doll's fainting bed, by the way. Fainting couch. And this is upstairs. It's called You're My Thrill. The, <clears throat> the piece has a lot of connotations, which I don't want to point to just one as being the one, but <clears throat> I do think that these conversations about masculinity and toxic masculinity and whatever you know you want to talk about, and also um, war. Uh, guns, all of that is in there. And the fact that I called it You're My Thrill, you know, that's, that's the title of an old Billy Holiday classic song. Uh, I mean, I, I think growing up, I did think that a lot of boys just couldn't wait to grow up and go to war, you know, because then they got a chance to fight and shoot guns and we have wars going on all around us now. 
This is another one. Beauty Sun Susi, which beauty Sun Susi, which means beauty without a care. Okay, my fascination with African American soldiers, particularly from World War I, besides the fact that I love their dignity, I love their outfits, the way that they wrap their boots up, um, <clears throat> has to do with the irony of being so proud to fight in a war for the freedoms of a society that does not allow them basic human rights. I mean, that, that if you think about it, it's, a, it's quite a, a loaded issue. Now, my, my grandfather always dreamed of going to war. He was born in 1904, and he went to the Columbia, South Carolina recruitment agency with another friend of his, and they told my grandfather he was too short, and they told his friend that he was too tall. <laughs> so, you know, he always dreamt of, like, seeing the world. So this piece is called Autour du Monde. And then I got into these um, small IDs and photo booth pictures. I thought this was hysterical. The love occupator. <laughs> <laughs> I have thousands, thousands of photographs. And they feed my work. And I began to work from mug shots, which I insist that with, in looking at the cards, the, the Kin series, that people realize that even though the majority of these are taken of, you know, as mugshots, that doesn't mean the person depicted committed the crime, okay? So, I discourage people from saying like, oh, I wonder what they did. They might not have done anything. They might just have been at the wrong place at the right time. You know, you just, I, I just feel that if I'm using the image of someone that's been taken at not such a great moment in their life, that I should be respectful and I should not uh, leave it to have negative thoughts about that individual. And I called this one oh, there's an expression, hope springs eternal. I cannot remember the name of this one, but in terms of the choice of objects, just to, to give you uh, an idea of how I, how I work and how I think, there was a time when I placed a bouquet of flowers there to try it out. And it made this boy look so effeminate. It almost made him look like a future drag queen. And then when I placed the bullets, it made him look ferocious and, you know, like, tough. You just saw a totally different aura coming from him. So, I chose the bullets. More? Oh. Uh, I do not remember the name of that. But those are real pearls, actually that my grandmother left me. And that is a brooch. I don't remember 
the titles of all of them, but they're all from the, these are all from the Kin series. And I gave that series that title because when I drew that first little boy, and then I drew the second one, I said, you know, these people feel just like family. So I decided to embrace them as my kin. The stands on, stand-ins for the kin that I will never know. This one, I love to tell people the name of it, it's Fakaruni. And um, in Arabic, that means it reminds me or I remember. I've traveled a lot. I spent time in Egypt and Morocco. This is called Moral Compass. I do not remember the title of it, but you know, the t they're all titled kin and they're numbered. And then there's like a phrase or a title that may say something about them or it may just suggest something poetic. This one, for example, is called The Island of My Skin. Now, my father's family is from Barbados. So I had that dual cultural thing, which, believe me, it was really, you know, like the two families they were at, at odds uh, between the African-American side, which was my mother's side, and the West Indian side, you know. Um, not all black people are the same, culturally and in temperament, et cetera. That was the second one that I did, and I used the flags in the second one, and <clears throat> I thought I would continue working with flags, but then I, I, I took it from there. There are 60 kitten pieces all together. This one is called 1619, which I thought I was the first one to research and learn that 1619 was the first time that blacks were brought to the Americas as slaves. But apparently, a lot of other people have found out by now. <laughs> Oh, this is the power of myth. This one I find very enchanting because you, uh, you can't really uh, you, you can't really tell, but the the guy's face has a lot of like bruises and pimples and scars, and his he looks like a really tough guy, and I juxtaposed him with this wedding slipper. And I, I will not remember what the title was, but it had something to do with if I could change myself into whatever shape and image I could, what would that be? Lots of pennies. I love money. This is Chave Chauva, which is uh, 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 um, Portuguese for um, uh, let it rain. And those are real rusty nails. Uh, driven into the wood, uh, not the wood, the paper. We saw that already. Okay, and this one is called Dida. 
You can read anything into that that you like. <laughs> Cannot remember the name of this. It's at the Phillips Collection. Oh, and this is one of my favorites. Is this in the show? I want you to know that I went through such a process of getting every bump and every pimple in his face and to capture the, the nappiness of his hair. It was really important to make this man as lifelike as possible. And the title is To Make Your False to make your false heart true. So I could tell you where that title comes from, but I'd, like to, I'd just like you to just, you know, come to your own conclusions. That's a flask, by the way, really silver. I think this one is called, uh, is it Fauna? that make sense? That's one of my taxidermy birds. <laughs> okay, I, I got this idea that I wanted to make a piece without drawing and using sound. And so all of these radios have recordings in them that, that play over one another. There are Billie Holiday uh, songs. There are uh, broadcasts from Windchill and, uh, and from the TV show Beulah, et cetera. Now, here we go. We're going to look at some images of the piece downstairs or upstairs, wherever it is. This is an actual photograph of Camp Contraband. That bridge shows you the, um, the, the distance across the Tennessee River, which the runaway slaves had to f somehow swim or, or sail or whatever, in order to get to the other side, where at, at Camp Contraband, they could <clears throat> uh, receive asylum from being recaptured and returned to their owners. So when I went to Chattanooga to do this, I, I, I only thing I knew about Chattanooga was the Chattanooga Choo Choo, and that was a song. We went to see it, and it's, you know, it's a very chic restaurant with an old model train in the, in the, in the, the front yard. But <clears throat> the, the spinning motions that the discs are placed in, in other words, the orientations are not straight up and down because I want it to create this feeling of spinning. And I also want it to allude just a little bit to the Chattanooga Jucha. And I wanted to also allude to the turmoil of trying to make this journey across the river. Because you know, many, many people died trying to cross the river. Hence the, the chair that's been swept away like in the Wizard of Oz. Now how did I come to this in Chattanooga? I couldn't find any remnants, any like tactile, uh, uh, un, like um, demolished sites in 
Chattanooga, only like people were telling me, oh, that parking lot over there is where Betsy Smith was born. Oh, and that's where all the speakeasies were, where jazz was invented. But they were all just demolished and uh, replaced by parking lots and um, like really chic restaurants. And <clears throat> so I didn't want to do a piece about Bessie Smith. That was a little too easy. I mean, I'm real into music, but that, that wasn't working for me. And so when I was taken all over Richmond, oh, Richmond, sorry, all over Chattanooga by this gentleman named Mr. White, he showed me all of the, the, the sites where things had been. And then I met with Mr. Black <laughs> at the um, Chattanooga Historical Society. And he had an office which was right on the river. And he pointed to some like little monument to the Trail of Tears, and he said, now right over there, just to the left of that, is where Camp Contraband was. I'm like, what's Camp Contraband? And he said, well, it was a, it was a, a, a union encampment where people knew that if they crossed, they made it across the river, they could get asylum, that they would be safe they would have escaped slavery. Click. Okay, you know that song? Deep river, my home. Okay, my home is over Jordan, deep river. I want to cross over into campground. So that's when I, dis I decided this was what I was going to do. But I'm telling you, I was really getting nervous about making work in a place where there was, you know, there was, there was history that had been erased. So I spent a couple of months making these discs. And I, I shot this footage of the waves and I actually loved doing all of these drawings. I cannot tell you. My mother, who was alive when I, when I, when I did this piece, <clears throat> I showed her pictures of her and she says, what are those, cheese boxes? <laughs> <laughs> but, the small ones are foundry molds, as I said, with Ashley in downtown Richmond is when I first discovered the foundry molds. And the coin pieces that are on the floor right before the parlor, those were the first times that I worked on foundry molds. And so the whole piece, uh, the whole piece came together from there went out and found every suitcase I could find. And I, I there, 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 there are supposed to be bird, birds that emanate from the suitcases, chirping birds of all types, representing the flight for freedom or toward freedom. And this man, I don't know, he just represents that passage because he's got the keys. Here, I'm giving you a sneak peek of a new series, 
similar to the, it's similar uh, in uh, formal aspects to the Ken series, but the, the, the pieces are much larger. It's called the Spell Suite. And the paper is very white. And the images of the people are from all sorts of sources. And they're from all time periods, do you know? They're not basically dealing with people from a certain era. By the way, the, wo the woman with the, with the flip hair and the broken record, the title on the record says, Oh, please believe me. <laughs> and this <clears throat> series is called Vinteriza. Now, you know, when we get older, we go through many stages or passages. When you get in your 50s, you know, you start, uh, people start losing their parents. And uh, it's, you know, by the time you think you've got your life together, you have other life passages to deal with. And so <clears throat> this work was done in Italy after my parents passed away. And it is called Vinterizer, which is a song cycle by Schubert. And it means winter's journey. It is about a man who is trying to escape grief and sorrow by trudging through the snow. I went back to Italy the next year and I decided to focus on life, which is why I chose this very vibrant red. So for me, the red represents blood, the flow of blood, and the b vibrancy of being alive, having been alive, etc. Here are some other things I'll just skip through, and then I hope you have some questions for me. By the way, that spins, and there's a music box, you know, uh, recording that, 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 that plays Lift Every Voice and Sing. You can see all of these downstairs. That's what you sit down and you listen to the song, sung with a lot of spirit. This piece is called Blackbird. And this one, which I'm very thrilled that the museum has acquired this before. <laughs> before the show even started. Um, actually, it was before they even uh, um, found the slot to, to take my show. So they must have liked it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to do, I wanted to work on tondos or cheese boxes. <laughs> and I, so I had them fabricated and this was the first one I did. I was looking to make an image of someone, a woman, who had all the fierceness, all the wisdom, all the gutsiness that my people have had to have in order to survive and persist. Now, if you notice, on the chair, there's the face of a man right behind her. He represents, for me, he represents that little voice in the back of your head saying you can't. And her face says, I can and I will. Now, there's a song that relates to this, which 
helped me think of a title. It's a song that was sung back in the 60s by Nina Simone called Blackbird. And the lyrics are, so why do you want to fly, Blackbird? You ain't ever going to fly. You don't have anyone to hold you. You don't have anyone to care. Why can't you understand you're not wanted anywhere? So why do you want to fly, Blackbird? You ain't ever going to fly. And so that's how I got my title. This is called Because I Want to Fly. So that's it for the slides.